from the BBC World Service and NRK. This is Death in Ice Valley. Maybe it's easier to conceal your identity if only you know who you are. It's hard to disappear these days. Footprints are left in the real and online world. There's always an email address, a text message, CCTV. In 1970, it was easier to live a life unchronicled, especially if you were trying to disappear. I'm Marit Higraf from NRK. And I'm Neil McCarthy from the BBC, bringing you episode three. The Remote Archive. Thanks to all of you who've been in touch with your comments and thoughts. As we've said, our investigation is ongoing and we're looking into some of the suggestions you've made. If you think you have a specific lead to share with us on this case, let us know. OK, Neil, we have a few more facts at our fingertips now after our trip to Stavanger in the south of Norway on the trail of the Isdal woman. That's right, we have a name and a nationality from her hotel registration form, which is quite exciting. She's one Fenella Lork from Belgium. What struck me is how vivid our witnesses' memories are of their very brief encounters with the Istal woman in hotels or shops. Well, you have to remember, Norway was a very different country back then. Foreigners really stood out. Iver Neumann is the director of Norwegian Social Research, and he can tell us more about that. In Norway, immigration only started in the very late 60s. So, you know, most people walking around in Norway would be lily white. And uh, in small places, most people would know one another. It was a much more transparent world, as it were. So that meant that everything that happened out of the ordinary was easier to spot than today. So, uh, yes, diplomats stood out in Norwegian society. People simply knew that they were foreigners. That wouldn't happen today when 29% of uh, Oslo's population is either foreign-born or born of two foreign-born parents. So there's been a huge change here, and you shouldn't forget that. A a lone woman traveling around like that must have had business. And uh, the business uh, must have been of of a specific kind. I mean, you're not a teacher if you travel like that. You may be a spy, you may be a prostitute, you may be a traveling saleswoman, but there aren't that many other possibilities. This became a big criminal case in Norway very quickly. Police were analysing everything, trying to make sense of the odd clues, like the wig and the code note they found in her suitcase. And of course, they were checking out the information on the hotel registration form. And presumably, they'd be cross-checking that info with the Belgian police. Yes, but it takes a little time before they get answers. I think we should first go back to the city of Bergen and pick up the trail. We know that she spent time there. We know that she left for Bergen the day she bought the boots. The reason for us knowing that is from the documents of the the police reports, you know. You've got a photocopy of something typed out, pretty old, uh, in front of you there. Yes, this is a witness statement, a witness interview with a taxi driver from Stavanger. This is a copy from the police files. So it says that... This taxi driver on the 18th of November 1970, and it's the same date that she checked out from the hotel, he was called for a ride from this hotel and out came a lady. It it says here he seemed that the the lady had a very sexy body. Literary stance here. Uh, She was good looking, broad hips, he says. And she spoke a very poor English But it was difficult for him to understand where she wanted to go. But after a while, he understood that she wanted to go to the hydrofoil boat. So he drove the lady down to this quay where the boat was, and he carried a suitcase for her on board the boat. Vingtor is the boat called. And the the lady herself carried the bag. This taxi driver said that he noticed that this woman had a gap between her front teeth when she smiled. So obviously she, she smiled to him. So it's definitely our woman. It's good witness testimony that, isn't it? So the taxi driver left 
the Istal woman on the hydrofoil so she could she could travel to Bergen on the 18th of November. Then the next thing we know is she checked in her luggage at the at the left luggage in Bergen railway station on the 23rd and then her body is found outside the city in the valley on the 29th of November. That's our timeline so far. <laughs> But, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd really quite like to know what kind of a city Bergen was back then. What sort of a city was she mingling in, moving around in? We still don't know who she knew there, but um, be good to get a sense of what it was like. Gunnar Stolesen, Bergen's famous crime writer, is waiting for us at the quayside. When I was 14, uh, I was living in this part of the harbour and went to the school over there, so I took that ferry to school uh, every day. It's very picturesque and atmospheric here, looking out across the flat grey waters of the harbour. On the other side of the bay is a row of traditional wooden buildings painted red and white and yellow. What are they? It's called Bryggen in Norwegian, and it's the old trading hub from the days of the Hanseatic League, when German traders dominated this region. It's one of the most famous sites in Bergen. And then there are more solid stone houses rising up into the hills behind the city, and then above them, trees. The reason that Bergen was a city almost 1,000 years ago is the harbour, and it was a very good harbour. It's sheltered by the winds, by the mountains around here, and the high waves by the islands, which is outside. And it's just in between the two longest fjords in Norway, the Sognefjord north of us and the Hardangerfjord south of us. So a lot of people from these fjords, they came to this good harbour to change things that they wanted to sell each other. Or they had a meeting place where boy could meet girl or whatever could happen. Tone Svanes, the receptionist in Stavanger, observed that the Easter woman was traveling alone. But I wonder if her story could also be one of boy meets girl, maybe here in Bergen. If she stayed for long periods, she must have had contact with someone. Yes, I've also been wondering if the Istal woman had a love interest in Norway. In terms of her murder, if she was murdered, because we don't know that yet, the UK crime statistics, at least, show that about 50% of women are murdered by their partners or ex-partners. So amongst many possibilities, hers could have been a love story gone wrong, some jealous lover or something. Yes, whenever a woman is killed, the police always first speak to their partner. Of course, they couldn't do that here because they didn't know who she was. Looking around Bergen Harbour, you can see dramatic narrow inlets from the sea that were formed by glaciers. They're found all along Norway's coastline and are called fjords. It's easy to see why Bergen is also known as gateway to the fjords. This is the big city fjord, Byfjorden, which leads into Bergen. And there are said to be seven mountains around Bergen. Where we stand now, we can see at least three of them. And where is the ice valley from here? The ice valley is just between Frey Mountain and Ulriken. And you can see the contrast very well because it's a green, there's a lot of buildings on the Frey Mountain. But the mountain of Ulriken, the part that we can see from here, is a bare, more or less treeless mountainside. And of course, if you took the here we go again <laughs> here it comes here it comes again the Bergen rain that's the third characteristic of Bergen you have the Bruggen you have the mountains and you have the rain it's never gone for long is it <laughs> oh, well it comes and goes but uh, I must say you have had quite a hard week here <laughs> when you are visiting now it, it can be a little bit more comfortable uh, this way and how long would it take to walk from from the town centre here to where the body was found? Oh, where the body was found, it would take at least one hour, perhaps yeah, one and a half. Istalen, or the Ice Valley, does look very remote and forbidding from the city today, with low-hanging dark clouds gathering inside it. lively part of Bergen in 1970? This was very lively. It was The reason was that was the passenger coming and going from the boats here and very soon we are coming to the fish market of Bergen. 
you could see cod swinging, live cod, and usually it was the mothers, the women who came here, and they pointed, I will have that. And then the fisherman took it up, knocked it in his head, and you got a live fish that you could take home and, quite fresh, make the day's dinner. After the police found her name in Stavanger, they were searching hotel records here in Bergen, trying to see where else Finella Lork had checked in. Remember, she traveled from Stavanger to Bergen by ferry, so she probably stayed here. But this is uh, part of the modern time coming to Bergen, because uh, what is typical for Bergen around 1970 is that the baby boomers, uh, children who were born uh, just after the Second World War, They were going into the universities, so there was a big student revolution going on. A lot of people was able to go to the university. Uh, she would most likely could have seen a demonstration against the uh, war in Vietnam, against atom bombs, and against the European Union, because there was a big discussion, should Norway be a member of the Union or not? And we had a big uh, vote about that in 72. And the discussion was going on the years before that. So it was a real time of change and tumult and generational tension. Yeah, and the, the young people were started to grow long hair. Uh, the girls had shorter skirts, they had hot pants for a period. Uh, and the music was uh, part of this uh, town's culture. We had some very good rock groups. Uh, so it was, for young people, a very lively town. So it's potentially quite an interesting time to be in Bergen um, for Fenella Lork in the last days of her life. But let's get back to the investigation in those first days after the body was found. Yes, the police were just about to make a breakthrough. They took her hotel card, studied the handwriting and searched in all the hotels of Bergen and in other big cities in Norway to see where else did Fenella Lork stay. Do you remember what the receptionist said at the hotel in Stavanger? I can remember her signature very clearly. And she had a very sort of big F with the upper line was rather long. And also the L from the lock was some sort of an underscore for the surname. Very distinctive handwriting. And what were they able to find out? That she hadn't stayed anywhere else. There were no records of a vanilla lork in any other hotels in Norway. The Norwegian police also checked the information on the hotel card with the police in Belgium. And they couldn't find any trace of Finella Lork and reported back that her passport number was false. Okay, well that's more than a bit suspicious. What they did find was her exact same handwriting on many other hotel registration cards up and down Norway and especially in Bergen. But, hold on, with seven different names. She had been traveling under at least seven different identities. Seven different names. She has to be a spy, right? I mean, this is starting to sound like something from the movies. Well, it looks that way, but we're not in Moscow or Washington. Why here in Norway? We'd better take a closer look at what could have attracted a spy to Norway in 1970. Well, the period is called the Cold War because it was an almost war between the Soviet Union on the one hand and the US on the other, and they both had their allies. And one of the U.S. allies was, of course, Norway. It was a founder member of NATO. NATO was the security organization that kept the U.S. and Europe together. The whole thing was about the East and the West feeding one another out. In 1968, liberal communists in Czechoslovakia wanted to do something else than the Soviet model. And the Soviet Union answered by going in and occupying the place. And that increased tensions. Ships where sort of Soviet ships were sighted off the Norwegian coast, for example. So 1970 is only two years after that. So we're in the depth of the Cold War, which means that people are feeling one another out. But it also means that uh, there is no immediate threat of a hot engagement. All those happen by proxy in the rest of the world. Africa, for example. 
So how did that affect a city like Bergen at the time? The biggest naval base in Norway had moved to Bergen in the early 60s. So what we saw in the streets of Bergen too were a lot of marine soldiers going out on leave for evening. And in the sea outside Bergen, there was regularly big NATO exercises when warships from the USA, from Germany, from England were in the harbour, very often in the weekends when they had a rest in the rehearsals. And there were submarines coming here. And during all the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of sightings of submarines in the fjords in the western part of Norway, which most likely were Russian submarines, or to see if there was some marine installation used. Because, of course, in the, in the 1960s and 70s, the Cold War was more or less on its strongest. It was a quite a big fear of a war against the Soviet Union. Soviet submarines snooping around the fjords whilst NATO conducts military exercises. Sounds like Bergen would have been a magnet for spies, with so much secret military intelligence in the air at the time. Spies like Finella Lork and her aliases? Could be, but we don't know that she was a spy. And if she was, then who was she spying for? What was she spying on? Where was she really from and what real evidence is there? Did Bergen have an international airport at the time? Yes, Flesland Airport was opened in 1956. So she could have come here by airplane. But to go by airplane at that time was quite expensive. But her lifestyle seems to have been quite expensive. She lived in hotels, she dressed well. Either she must have had much money herself or somebody must, must have financed her travels. And that also points like her being part of a criminal organization or if she was then an international agent. No matter which world she was moving in, the reality is she died on that bleak hillside in the most suspicious circumstances. Now, often in these cases, the body itself contains clues. And I'm just thinking back, you told me that the body of the Istar woman was taken to the Gardas Institute at the University Hospital in Bergen for the autopsy. What happened there? We should go there and ask. Professor Inge Moril is the chief forensic pathologist at the hospital. I'll introduce you to him. One of his predecessors did the original autopsy. So this is the forensic autopsy room. So would it have been somewhere like here that the Istal woman was brought? Yeah, something like this. And could you just explain what a forensic pathologist does? A forensic pathologist tries to discover the cause of death in police cases. And that is, uh, in Norway, people who are murdered... They are victims of, from accidents, suicides. So that is the first part of our work. The second part is uh, identification, that people have to be identified. And uh, that's what we, we do, both in single cases and in mass disasters or big act- accidents. That's the main part of, of the job, to try to identify that people. So that's why I'm involved in this case. So... Should we have a look at the autopsy report for the Easter woman? What do you read out of it? Uh, the funny thing is that uh, the, the autopsy report is very similar to the reports we make today. It's uh, describing how the body was found and who found it and how she was lying. And then uh, it, there is a description of how she looked like when she was brought into this institute. And tell us, how did they conclude concerning death cause? It was concluded that uh, the fire was very important, obviously, because she had soot in her respiratory uh, tract, yes? Yeah, soot from the fire. When you breathe in, in a fire, you breathe smoke, then you get soot in your airways. So when they saw that, they 
and uh, you also get a, a slightly uh, red coloration of your skin caused by the carbon monoxide. And that, that is a very good sign of carbon monoxide poisoning. So that, they concluded that that was probably the reason, the cause of death. But then they got the results from the toxicology, which uh, revealed that she had, uh, in addition to carbon monoxide, a lot of uh, drugs in her blood, which is a barbiturate. So uh, both the uh, concentration of uh, carbon monoxide and the concentration of barbiturate could be the cause of death. Mm -hmm. It's uh, an open verdict. It is also said that the burn injuries could have been contributing factors, but it's open. And uh, it is not concluded whether it was a suicide or an accident or a homicide. This is significant, because I'd assumed up until now that she died of burns or of smoke inhalation, and that was it. But now we, these pills are detailed in the autopsy. It was, in fact, also the most common type of pill used by women who took their lives with an overdose, at least at that time. A common form of suicide, and yet a very strange place to do it, a strange way to do it. Why make all that effort and go into that, all the way into that desolate valley and, and put herself on fire and all these arrangements with the things she brought in that valley? So it would have been easier to do that just lying in your hotel bed, taking the pills. Anyone who's ever watched the crime drama nowadays will know that many identification cases are solved using DNA evidence. But the body was buried here in Bergen, as we know. And the body holds the evidence inside that zinc coffin. Yes, that's right. Her grave is here in a Bergen cemetery, but it's very complicated for all kinds of ethical, legal and practical reasons to exhume the body to take samples like tissue and bone for analysis. Any tissue samples, hair or teeth, could give us excellent new possibilities with our unique genetic code, DNA, that didn't exist in 1970. It would be a massive breakthrough in our attempt to identify her if we are able to find any of her remains, then extract DNA and match it, if we find a relative. It sounds like without that hard scientific evidence, it's going to be very difficult to find out who she was. Just find the right key. There is a lot of teeth in here. With... I contacted Inge Morel when I began this investigation to see whether there was any physical trace of the Easter woman in the hospital archives. As you can see, uh, there are a number into years. Listen carefully now. This is a recording in Norwegian of our original search. Here we have the from... Uh, we have the tissue blocks in boxes marked numbers 133 to 145 and 134 will be from 1970. So I'll have to risk life and limb to get up on a chair to reach that shelf. Let's see how it goes. It is... So, uh, here are the tissue blocks. And if we take that block there, and then we look here at the number on the report, we'll find the one that matches. It may be that's the Isdal woman. Yes. Inside these paraffin blocks is preserved tissue from the Isdal woman, from her internal organs. And when there is tissue, there are cells, and from there you can extract a DNA profile, which can lead to identification or the possibility of identification. I think it would be very exciting if there were a, a DNA hit in Europe or the world and we find out her identity. It'd be amazing and, and worth writing about in international journals. Ah, but here are the fingerprints and a police drawing. 
<laughs> it's not today's CSI style, but uh, here, uh, here are photos of the teeth and some x-rays. Before the body was buried, they actually took out the jaws and teeth and kept them in case she could be identified at a later date. Yeah, we've got a key here to the remote archive where old things are stored that haven't been thrown away. We could search for the teeth of the Isdal woman. It'd take a while to get there, but uh, we just have to follow. I'm skeptical about us finding anything, I must say, but, but we should try. What was it like to be there, Marit? Oh, it was so exciting. I mean, just to find, to see these tissue samples from this dead woman, almost 50 years old samples, it was so exciting. And then knowing we are going to search for the jaw, hoping to find it. We're now far below the hospital itself, in what is called the pathologist's remote archive, which has a collection of tissue samples of the same type we saw from the Isdal woman. But there are also some other things, human remains saved by colleagues who retired. This, actually, the... Uh, uh, that's the jaw from an unidentified person. It's, it's not what we're looking for. Let's see, there's one more in there. Do not throw away medieval skull, this one says. There are several jaws here, but... Uh, they all are remains from unidentified persons. That's why they aren't destroyed, just waiting for a time when they can offer new information. Here. Uh, I see something marked 1970. I'll risk my life a little bit more and see if I can reach it. Oh, I beg for forgiveness. I do not mean to be disrespectful. Here it says 134-70. That's her number. Now, this really is exciting. Shall I my hand? My hands are shaking as I open it, eh? This is the jaw of the Isdal woman. It is completely unbelievable. See, there are even some good teeth in place. See the fillings in the lower jaw teeth. We also see the gold there. Yeah, so there's no doubt. This is the same jaw as on the picture. The same teeth, eh? And here is her number. <laughs> we'll take these with us. Dagens Fangst. Catch of the day. Catch of the day. a big catch. Tissue samples and the jawbone full of gold teeth. It was an incredible and unexpected find. It's high value in terms of DNA. We need to take this new physical evidence to scientific specialists and we'll also need the cooperation of the police and their laboratories. Let's see what it can tell us today about her identity that it couldn't in 1970. 
an identity she was very good at covering up with her many different names. So perhaps the science could reveal who she really was. But it's hard not to think that the Eastal woman was on a secret mission when she was here in Norway. Yes, I agree on that. But what kind of mission? Next week on Death in Ice Valley, shady goings on. I today believe that she was murdered because she had not swallowed all the pills. She had uh, the pills in her mouth and I think it, the pills were forced into her. <laughs>